Okay. We are just going to wait another moment or two for our ranking member to sign on, if that's all right with you. Perfect. All right. 
This hearing of the Subcommittee on Conservation and Forestry entitled a 2022 Review of Farm Bill Conservation Programs will come to order. Welcome and thank you for joining today's hearing. After brief remarks, members will receive testimony from our witnesses today and then the hearing will be open to questions. Uh, good morning to our witnesses and welcome to today's, today's hearing to update members on the status and operation of NRCS and FSA conservation programs. We are here today to examine how America's voluntary conservation programs are working for producers, how investments in USDA's conservation programs are addressing our resource needs, and how these programs can be utilized to help address the climate crisis. This hearing presents an opportunity for us to discuss what is working and what can work better as we look ahead to the 2023 Farm Bill. I would like to welcome both Chief Cosby and Administrator Ducheneau to the subcommittee today. I know subcommittee members on both sides of the aisle are looking forward to hearing your updates as to how the programs that you oversee are working for farmers, ranchers, and foresters across the nation. Your agencies have been hard at work, and Administrator Ducheneau, I would like to first mention the work you are doing to get folks enrolled in CREP, uh, in CRP through a new sign-up and uh, to expand CREP by enabling negotiations of matching funds. And Chief Crosby, I know that January has been a big month for NRCS, and I commend all that you are doing to expand access to conservation across the country. Your announcement of 118 new equity conservation cooperative agreements shows a commitment to bringing the benefits of conservation to historically underserved communities. In addition, I'm especially excited about the work that NRCS is doing to expand available resources for farmers embracing climate smart agriculture. Farmers are the original conservationists, and there is so much we can learn from our growers and producers on how to combat the climate crisis. That's why I'm proud uh, to be the sponsor of the Bipartisan Growing Climate Solutions Act. Our legislation is supported by nearly every major American farm group, as well as many major environmental groups and Fortune 500 companies, not to mention many growers and foresters across Virginia's 7th District. In a time when bipartisanship is hard-earned, this bill stands as a testament to how we can work together for our constituents. If only we are willing to come to the table in good faith and set partisanship aside. This legislation passed the Senate last year on a vote of 92 to 8, and it's long past time for the House to follow suit and do right by our farmers, rural America, and our planet. Today, I'm thrilled that the USDA is already taking bold steps to bring farmers to the table on climate-smart agriculture. NRCS's recent announcement that EQIP conservation incentive contracts will be available nationwide and that the USDA will be launching a new streamlined cover crop program demonstrates the agency's commitment to making it easier for farmers to work to address climate concerns while benefiting their bottom lines. In addition to your update to CSP that allows producers to immediately re-enroll the following year, it's a great step uh, towards making it easier for, for producers to participate. Finally, the $225 million investment in RCPP will enable more investments that leverage partner dollars and participation. All of these programs deliver on-the-ground resources that help us mitigate and adapt to climate change and benefit our producers. I'm eager to hear more about the changes uh, that you all are making and your plans for the future. And with that, I uh, look to ranking member of the full committee uh, for his opening comments. Well, uh, thank you, Chair Spanberger, and, uh, and I, I think uh, hopefully uh, Ranking Member LaMoffa, who is going to be able to join us here virtually and uh, momentarily. Uh, thank you both for holding today's hearing. Uh, it's hard to believe it's already been just over three years since the 2018 Farm Bill, um, and then when the bill was signed into law. Uh, today begins the process of reviewing the implementation of the Farm Bill, allowing members the opportunity to hear how program changes are working, and ensuring these changes are being administered as Congress intended. And this is an immensely important responsibility of this committee, oversight, and a review of each title must be completed before we can even begin to contemplate the next Farm Bill reauthorization. Uh, as a former chairman of this subcommittee, I'm excited to, to uh, kick off this process by reviewing conservation programs. I have long appreciated the great benefits that locally led incentive-based voluntary conservation provides for both the environment, uh, agriculture producers, uh, uh, the economy, 
uh, as an effective tool for delisting endangered species uh, and climate. All great outcomes as a result of these great conservation programs that we've codified over the years. Now, during the writings of the 2014 Farm Bill, when I chaired the subcommittee, there was a concerted effort to strengthen, simplify, and streamline our conservation programs. And since then, including the 2018 Farm Bill, this committee provided further reforms to, to increase the financial support and improve the delivery of these programs to producers. Now, I'd like to, um, I have to say that it, it must remain the conservation title and not be repurposed as the climate title. You know, I think uh, sequestering greenhouse gases is, a, is an obvious uh, outcome of our conservation programs. That's why uh, American farmers, ranchers, and foresters are climate heroes. Uh, they, they really lead the way in the world uh, for, uh, uh, on, the, on the issue of climate and uh, sequestering over 6.1 gigatons of carbon annually, uh, far more than what's admitted in, in that uh, vast land space of what is considered all under the title of natural land solutions. Uh, but it must be the conservation title. Uh, um, now, uh, while a number of conservation programs can, can clearly provide climate benefits, as I've discussed, the, the broad emphasis of Title II and its programs must remain on the proven conservation practices that will directly benefit the producer and support the sustainability of American agriculture. And with that in mind, I, I remain concerned over a rush to implement some of the climate-related proposals through uh, farm bill programs or, or administratively by USDA before being fully vetted by this committee. Uh, the, the agriculture portion of the Build Back Better is just one example of pursuing questionable policies with significant funding through the Agriculture Committee without any vetting to any degree or considering long-term impacts of such action. Our conservation programs are critical for the sustainability of our of our farms and ranches, and as such, long-term changes should be made through thoughtful consideration by this committee. With all this in mind, I'm really pleased that we're holding this, uh, uh, this today's hearing uh, and, uh, and that we're finally beginning the oversight process of the 2018 Farm Bill, ensuring programs are implemented as Congress intended. Uh, Chief Cosby and uh, Administrator DeJoe, uh, thank you both for participating today and being here. Uh, your leadership is much appreciated, and we look forward to your testimony. And with that, Madam Chair, I, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. And I want to just express my appreciation that you so consistently come to our subcommittee hearings. Um, I think that speaks to the importance that you put on this issue, so I appreciate you being here. Um, I am looking now to confirm... Um, uh, that we're going to move forward with witness testimony, and I'll invite the ranking member of the subcommittee to give his opening remarks uh, when he's able uh, to join us. Uh, again, there were some travel challenges, um, and I um, greatly uh, recognize sometimes the challenges facing our West Coast members. So he'll join us uh, when he's able. Um, and with that, I would also request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so that witnesses may begin their testimony and ensure that there is ample time for questions. So I'm pleased to welcome two distinguished witnesses to the committee today. Our first witness is Mr. Zach Ducheneau, the administrator of the Farm Service Agency. And our second witness is Mr. Terry Cosby, the chief of the Natural Resources Conservation Service. You will have five minutes to deliver your testimony. There's a timer that's visible uh, before you. It will count down to zero, at which point your time has expired. So Mr. Ducheneau, I welcome you to begin first. Please begin when you're ready. Good morning. Chair Spamberger, Ranking Member LaMalfa, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it is an honor and privilege to appear before you today. To those I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Zach Ducheneau, and I am the Administrator of the Farm Service Agency. Prior to joining the Farm Service Agency, I was a third generation rancher on my family's operation on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation. While folks don't always think of the Farm Service Agency as a conservation focused agency, our conservation division oversees several programs that protect our drinking water, improve soil health, reduce erosion, preserve wildlife habitat, and restore forests and wetlands for future generations. Our emergency conservation programs also support producers whose operations are damaged by natural disasters. I've always appreciated FSA's commitment to voluntary, producer-focused, working lands conservation, 
and I'm committed to maintaining those key pillars in our conservation programs. At the same time, we have a unique opportunity to expand and in some cases reimagine these programs to bring in new and diverse partners, better address the climate crisis, and invest in the long-term health of our land and the producers who care for it. In my written testimony, I have highlighted FSA's key conservation programs, and today I'd like to share some of the changes and updates we have implemented since I've become administrator. The Conservation Reserve Program is FSA's flagship conservation program and is one of the largest private lands conservation programs in the United States. Through CRP, FSA provides program participants with an annual rental payment in exchange for removing environmentally sensitive land from customary agriculture production and planting long-term resource conserving species. Last year, we made several improvements to increase producer interest and enrollment in CRP while strengthening the climate benefits of this program. Specifically, we adjusted soil rental rates where data supported such an adjustment, increased payments for practice incentives, and increased payments for water quality practices. We also added a climate smart practice incentive for CRP general and continuous signups to better leverage this program towards climate outcomes, including carbon sequestration. Our changes to CRP have already begun to pay off. Last year, producers and landowners enrolled 5.3 million acres through signups, turning the tide of declining enrollment from the previous four years. The total signup of 5.3 million acres surpassed USDA's 4 million acre goal and reversed a trend of decreasing enrollment. And we're especially happy with our signup for the grasslands program, 2.6 million acres. Also in my written testimony, I've provided information on several key conservation programs under the CRP umbrella, but given the limited time today, I want to focus on the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program and the changes that we made there, the changes we've made there that will further inspire public-private partnership and also work more with our underserved communities, including tribal governments. I want to take a moment or two to discuss two of our disaster assistance programs that are housed within FSA's Conservation Division. First, the Emergency Conservation Program, which provides assistance to farmers to repair damage caused in natural disasters. In response to the drought, we expanded our policies to allow producers of livestock to use portable pumps to better distribute grazing in their overtaxed property because of the, because of the drought. Second, the Emergency Forest Restoration Program provides payments to owners of non-industrial private forests to carry out emergency measures and to restore land damaged by natural disasters. In fiscal year 2021, we allocated $56.9 million to critical EFRP assistance, as well as $140 million to, to the Emergency Conservation Program. In closing, I want to share, the op I want to take this opportunity to express my gratitude and admiration for the entire USDA workforce, especially the team that I get to work with at the Farm Service Agency. There isn't a farmer or rancher in the country that would be disappointed at the caliber and quality of work of those I get to surround myself with every day. And I, I make sure that I give them the proper credit they deserve. In the last two years, we've delivered nearly double our normal program allocations and done so oftentimes homeschooling our children in the background. So we really wanna take our hats off to that staff, let them know we appreciate the good work and also thank the committee and the Congress for the opportunity that we get to deliver the programs that you authorize and fund for us to carry out to improve outcomes for our producers all across the country. Thank you. Mr. Ducheneau, thank you for your testimony <clears throat> and, and certainly thank you for putting in perspective the tremendous work of uh, the employees of the uh, the FSA, particularly given the unique challenges we faced over the past uh, the past year and a half, two years with the pandemic, Mr. Cosby, please begin your testimony when you are ready. Chair Springberger, Ranking Member Lamafla, and also Representative Thompson and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to provide an update on the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service Farm Bill programs. My name is Terry Cosby and I'm honored to serve as the 17th Chief of NRCS. I've been with the agency for more than 40 years, beginning my career as an NRCS intern in Iowa in 1979. I appreciate the ongoing support this subcommittee has provided for voluntary private lands conservation, and I look forward to the conversation today. The last two years of COVID-19 pandemic has been extremely challenging with unprecedented pressures on our staff and customers. 
directly influencing the way we operate at the field level. Our staff and agriculture producers have also faced devastating extreme weather events, including tornadoes, drought, wildfires, and flooding. In the face of these challenges, NRCS staff continues to successfully implement conservation programs as well as offering innovative improvements that respond to the needs and challenges of our customers across the country. As we will discuss today, addressing the climate crisis and advancing equity are core components of our work. I would note a few highlights from the past year that illustrates the impact of our conservation programs. Our two core working lands conservation programs are the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, EQIP, and the Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP. In fiscal year 21, we enrolled 34,054 EQIP contracts, totaling nearly $1.26 billion. We also enrolled 4,495 new CSP contracts on 5.8 million acres and 2,709 CSP renewals on 3.8 million acres. Our easement program, the Agriculture Conservation Easement Program, ASAP, support landowners in protecting, restoring, and enhancing wetlands and working farms and ranches. During fiscal year 21, we enrolled nearly 200,000 acres in ASAP. I also highlight the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which leverages partner investments to deliver conservation solutions. In FY21, NRCS announced $330 million in 80, for 85 new RCPP classic projects and $75 million for 15 alternative funding awards. We also work with partners through the Conservation Innovative Grant Program, which supports the adoption and evaluation of innovative conservation approaches. Administrator Ducineau will discuss FSA conservation programs, but I will note that NRCS provides the conservation planning and the technical assistance. In FY21, NRCS provided conservation planning and technical assistance on 4.8 million acres for a total of 58,800 new CRP contracts. As we deliver on our conservation programs, we're expanding the furthering target our investments for climate smart agriculture and forestry. This includes announcements within EQIP, CSP, and RCPP, as well as an update list of climate smart conservation activities. That being said, our programs remain open subscribe with demand for climate smart practices and programs well exceeding available funding. The Build Back Better Act will make it a historic investment in our volunteer conservation program that support farmers, ranchers, and forest land owners in addressing the climate. The additional investment would target the most effective conservation activities to address the climate crisis, and NRCS is well positioned to quickly deliver these programs to producers across the country. As we expand our investment in climate smart agriculture, we recognize the importance of qualifying conservation outcomes, which include carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas reductions. This work would contribute to soil monitoring efforts across the department. Implementation of our conservation programs and these important updates is, of course, dependent on our staff and capacity across the country. In FY21, we used direct hire authorities to bring on 1,141 new employees, and an aggressive hiring strategy will continue to support our overall staffing goals as we implement our key priorities. Currently, we have 10,361 staff directly employed by the agency and 2,465 staff employed through partners. Across program implementation as well as hiring, the value of equity and inclusion are vital components of our work. We recently announced $50 million in cooperative agreements to expand access to conservation assistance. These agreements will expand the delivery of conservation assistance to farmers who are new to farming, low-income, social disadvantage, or military veterans. Expanding access to programs and services also include insurance support is available for urban producers. NRCS houses the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production, which was established for the 2018 Farm Bill. While the office is located within NRCS, it is coordinated as a department-wide effort to leverage tools and services that support urban agriculture. To date, approximately 11 million in grants and cooperative agreements have been awarded for projects that support food access, community gardens, urban farms, and food waste reduction. In conclusion, thank you for the opportunity to come before the subcommittee to provide an update on NRCS Farm Bill programs. I appreciate Congress' committed continued support for NRCS and voluntary conservation on working lands. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you both for your testimony today. At this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members. Uh, you will be recognized for five minutes each in order to allow us to get in as many questions as possible. Please keep your microphones muted until you are recognized in order to minimize background noise. I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. 
And Chief Crosby, I would like to ask you a question about the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, RCPP. Um, it's brought diverse groups together to address natural resource concerns in a really focused manner that leverages USDA investment with private sector dollars. Um, and this program has worked very well uh, since it was first authorized with the 2014 Farm Bill. However, recently partners have expressed concerns about some of the bureaucratic hurdles and challenges. Have you heard about any of these concerns and are you taking any steps uh, to address them? Chair Springer, Berger, thank you for the question. And you know, I've had an opportunity to work with this program since it, since it came in in 2014 as a state conservationist and bringing partners together to leverage the federal investment. It's, it's worked really well. It, it was, it's a great program. It continues to flourish. We have heard concerns, and I will tell you that we are addressing those. Uh, we, we need our partners to really continue to bring those forward to us as we talk about this. We recently announced uh, RCPP and, and the new investment that we're going to make, and we think we've streamlined the process. Uh, we are working to train our field staff on how to deliver it more effectively and efficiently. And so we've heard those concerns and we are addressing those. Uh, thank you, Chief Crosby. That, um, that's certainly music to my ears and, and I um, would love to follow up and determine if there's any way that we can ensure that any challenges that might be brought to our congressional offices um, are something that we can relay as you continue to make those improvements. Um, moving on with my questions, on January 10th, 2022, USDA announced the use of EQIP and CSP to promote select climate change related goals, including a partnership with the Farmers for Soil Health initiative and targeted EQIP funding for cover crop adoption. How are these changes to Farm Bill programs expected to increase adoption of climate smart practices? These type of partnerships are, are really important because it gives us an opportunity to work with the folks, the boots on the ground, my staff, also with farmers that, that, that belong to a lot of these organizations that we are working with alongside of. And so it's provided, it's provided some great opportunity for us to hear exactly what's happening on the landscape and also partner with some organizations to get uh, more conservation on the ground. This is really important. We know that we can't do it all by, on our own and by ourselves. And so the more partnerships that we have and the more investment from private organizations, I think we have a better chance of looking at how do we help with uh, climate um, drought and all of the things that happens when we have this adverse weather going on around the country. So one more question to follow up on that. Um, last month, Secretary Vilsack identified several climate change related achievements by NRCS and other agencies, including the investment of $10 million to support climate smart agriculture and forestry through voluntary uh, conservation in EQIP. And funding for EQIP was uh, authorized at $1.8 billion in FY 2021. Does NRCS in plan to increase the amount of funding for EQIP directed to climate smart agricultural practices looking at FY22? If so, by how much? And, and frankly, how does that funding level for FY21 compare with other USDA announcements citing EQIP or other voluntary practices? Well, not only with EQIP, we're looking at how do we um, incorporate climate smart solutions into all the programs that we administer through NRCS. And we are working very closely with our state conservations out across the country as we, uh, we also we, the first time ever, I think that I can remember, we gave state, states their budgets in, in October. It gives them 12 months to plan. And also it helps us to look at what are the deeds out there? What are the resource concerns? What are the things that we really need to be keen on? And EQIP is, one, is that program that we need to really work through. And it gives our folks an opportunity to work with the state technical committees out there across the country to set those priorities when we look at those resource concerns. And so EQIP is an opportunity for us to keep adjusting and looking at how efficient it is and how effective it is. And also when, you, when we talk about um, the climate crisis that we're having, uh, EQIP is one of those solutions that we have. Uh, Administrator Duchesneau, I'm short on time, but looking at how the 2018 Farm Bill reauthorized an amended, amended CRP, um, uh, what challenges has, has your agency had in enrolling acres in CRP, and how could that program be amended to address those challenges? As, as far as amending, ma'am, whatever the Congress decides to do, we will work our best to implement it. 
but we've made some changes to soil rental rates that have really helped drive enrollment up. We made an increase in the grassland CRP, which significantly drove, the interest, drove interest up. And it's important to remember that every additional acre we enroll in CRP is another choice that a producer has to be an economic player in the global climate change mitigation effort. Thank you, and there's certainly financial impact for them. Thank you very much to our witnesses, and I now recognize uh, Ranking Member Thompson for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, gentlemen, um, Administrator Chief, thank you both once again for, for being here. In the stalled uh, Build Back Better Act, there's a $28 billion in funding for climate practices. And that money is almost equal to a doubling of funding for the current Farm Bill Conservation Programs. Uh, a significant portion of the funding is backloaded in the last two years of the bill. For example, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, RCPP, receives over $3 billion in FY26, 10 times the amount of funding it receives in the Farm Bill. So, Chief Cosby, did the House or Senate, I mean, this was really done with little to no transparency. I would border on no transparency uh, as it went to... Uh, you know, went through this legislative process in the House. Did the House or, or Senate Democrats consult with the department on this funding? Sir, what I, what I would say to that is, is that, you know, we work very closely with all the members, and we have a very capable staff out there. Whatever the dollar amount that Congress appropriates to these to, to these, we will be able to implement. Well, that, uh, we're that, very that, happy. And we'll, we'll get to that part. That's my next question. So thanks for anticipating it. But um, this is about direct consultation. Did, did the uh, House, Dem I can tell you that the House Republicans were not consulted. I and its ranking member were not consulted. So was there a direct consultation by the department with House Democrats? Uh, or, well, let's just start with that, I guess. Well, and again, and the way I would answer that is, is that you know we provide technical assistance when asked by members of Congress, and I'm sure that there were some conversations that were had. So, you, but we we provide technical assistance when we're asked. So, so you're not sure you? I, I you, am. You, I am. I'm not sure of that. Not sure. But I can I can take okay. that question back and get you to answer. I appreciate it. that. Would be great. Uh, do you you know do you believe that the department has the ability, and this was kind of what you're getting to, to to get that money out the door, and if so, what what would that plan look like? Sir, we are, we're in the middle of, you know, we're an aggressive hiring strategy. We had direct hire authority last year. We were able to bring on a lot of employees. We also have a lot of partners across the country that really help us with this, and we do agreements, and, and we have all, a lot of boots on the ground to help do this work. We believe, no matter what Congress appropriates, we can deliver. Yeah. And we have, we have the right skill sets. We have the right men and, and women across the country just to do that. Well, well, trust me, I'm obviously a big fan of USDA. We talked about that before we started, and, and I appreciate your leadership, and I appreciate the men and women that work at USDA. But what, what would you have me say to the, to the farmers as I t uh, interact with them, whether it's here in Washington or crisscrossing the country, as I have done and continue to do, because I want them to bring their voices uh, to the farm 2023 farm bill process, what would you? How would you have me respond when they they express their concerns with this because they have concerns with just um, the current programs we have getting that money out the door and uh, and we're talking about a, uh, as I referenced an incredible increase in the amount of funds and we have frustrations now with the current programs. Um, what should I tell them when I hear that? Because I expect I'm going to, that's going to continue to be a common theme. What I would say is my agency and RCS and also FSA, we are a trusted partner with the American producers across the country, and we deliver. And no matter what the program is, we, and we've seen no letdown from anything. Our staff is able to deliver. As I described earlier, most of our programs are oversubscribed, so Anything, any dollars that are invested in conservation is going to be a great day, and our staff is there ready to deliver that. So we are a trusted partner with the voluntary land users out there that do voluntary conservation. Yeah, and I agree with that, but there's, there are serious concerns, especially with with the amount of money that the $28 billion exponentially increased without, without really any farm bill hearings. Um, 
uh, the, uh, while many of the private companies have made major climate commitments, they oftentimes are struggling to find ways to achieve their goals despite having significant financial resources. Simultaneously, USDA conservation programs are oversubscribed and agricultural producers have difficulty accessing these vital programs. And for this reason, I introduced the Sustains Act, which would allow USDA to accept and match donated private funds to stretch the federal dollar. The idea is that third parties could directly partner with USDA to fund conservation programs, which we know are tremendously effective in, in dealing with climate, climate change, uh, and uh, that investment through the existing programs. Uh, uh, do you support this legislation, or do you support that concept of, of of a public-private approach where we are able to, you know, um, create something that would, uh, uh, the private sector would be able to support USDA in, uh, in the work that you do with conservation programs? Many of our programs support private and, and public partnerships. And so we are working through a lot of those, like RCPP, and it, it is working. And so we, we support that through the conservation programs that we have right now. I have not had an opportunity to study at length the bill that you're talking about, but I will do so, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. The chair now recognizes uh, Congresswoman Pingree from Maine for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for having this hearing, and thank you to both of our witnesses. Really, really appreciate the work that you're doing, and, and uh, grateful to have you here with us today. Um, I wanted to talk first uh, to uh, Mr. Crosby, Chief Crosby. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I want to talk first a little bit about CSP and, frankly, the important role it can play as a climate solution. It's such a uh, conservation stewardship program, is such a valuable tool. Now, um, the ranking member just brought up this issue about the funding in the Build Back Better Act. Uh, and the increase in funding, but sort of contrary to what he was saying, I found in Maine, uh, we've only been able to fund about one quarter of the application. So uh, the added resources in the Build Back Better Act would be extremely important to my state, and I'm sure that's true in Pennsylvania as well, that there's not sufficient funding. So um, I hope we are able to get uh, increases in funding and, and make that money available to our farmers who are anxious to use this already. But could you talk to me a little bit more about how we use CSP as a tool um, in combating climate change and why that's a particularly helpful program? You know, and as a state conservationist, I had an opportunity to administer CSP and now as chief, and it's one of those programs. It's the biggest working lands conservation program that we have, and it is very successful. And you know we have a lot of producers out there that, that transition from EQIP to CSP, which, which, like I say, has been very successful. One of the things that we've seen is, is that in the fifth year, producers have an opportunity to, uh, to re-enroll. And there was something in that, that was in our policy that said that if you didn't re-enroll in that fifth year, you had to sit out two years and wait. So we were able to uh, waive that and make sure that uh, producers have an opportunity uh, to re-enroll right after that fifth year. But it's, it, is, it is a very successful program. We've identified 81 um, enhancements in the CSP that we think has the best chance to help us with the climate crisis. Um, and we've also identified some practices also on our equip program, but we've identified 81 enhancements that we have, know that will help with uh, soil sequestration and also greenhouse gas emissions. That's great. Well, thank you. Um, I really appreciate 81 is a big number, but I know that's going to cover some of the things that I've put in my bill, as you mentioned, um, soil health, carbon sequestration, uh, a variety of other things. I want to um, take a, a different tack here. And again, um, thank you, uh, uh, Chief Tom Cosby, for talking to me about this question. And um, that's about PFAS. <clears throat> um, Maine has been a little bit ahead of the curve on testing for PFAS contamination, which means that we've identified, unfortunately, a handful of farms that are affected by these forever chemicals. Um, but we know there are many more in Maine as we increase our testing, and we know it's not just a Maine problem. Last week, the state of Michigan issued a consumption advisory about beef from one farm that was found to have high levels of PFAS. Uh, I know that NRCS could assist farms if they make the difficult decision to dispose of contaminated animals, but I'd like to hear more about what NRCS could be doing to support farmers in this devastating situation. 
And thank you for the question. And yes, we, we've been working, my staff and I, we've been working on this. Um, we, I think we've identified some areas that we can be helpful. Uh, as we are out on those farms and working with those landowners, you know, we can talk about what are some of the things that can help mitigate uh, PFAS and get, get those herds back to uh, producing uh, the type quality of milk that, that, that is needed. Also on the disposal side, uh, we are working very closely with our staff to identify how we can help with that. Now our agency, uh, while we may be able to provide some financial assistance to dispose of that herd, you know, we have to make sure that we are uh, following all state rules and regulations as far as disposal and where those animals can be buried. We do not make that decision on where those animals can be buried. So we work with the state uh, authorities to make sure that happens. But we are working to look at our standard and specs and how we can help those landowners make decisions on getting those herds healthy. And then if they can't get them healthy, then we have an opportunity to help them if they have to dispose of the animals. Well, thank you for that. And I, I know you share my concerns that um, farmers in this situation not only face the devastating uh, possibility of, of losing their animals um, and the challenges that faces with herds that you've been cultivating your whole life and also the economic loss it can be. This is a, a devastating problem and we have to support it much more. I just want to add one quick thing. Um, in the in the 2018 Farm Bill, um, soil testing was added to the EQUIP program. So I hope that NRCS could help uh, defray some of the very significant costs of soil testing for PFAS that farmers in our state are currently taking on. I'm out of time, but I can uh, connect with you about that. Um, but I do want to reiterate that soil testing is extremely important and we need some assistance with that. So I will yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Allen from Georgia for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman and uh, Administrator Deschanel and Chief Crosby. Thank you for both for coming for this committee today. Uh, this is an important hearing, and uh, obviously, with the uh, you know to write a new farm bill, we need to know how the existing farm bill uh, is going and what improvements we can make to it. Uh, and I'm very glad that this committee is taking up. Uh, and, these issues, uh, but, uh, you know, and of course we, we, we talk primarily about climate change and I gotta be honest with you, when I'm in my district, I don't hear anybody talking about climate change. Uh, I hear them talking about like uh, the cost of gasoline uh, uh, and, and finding uh, gasoline and uh, the cost of everything. Uh, obviously there's a war on fossil fuel. Uh, I don't know what that's doing to agriculture. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's increasing the price of food at the grocery stores. There's also very much concern about grocery store shelves being empty. And uh, in fact, I got a question the other day about, hey, are we looking at a major food shortage uh, in this country? And so obviously, uh, you know, we, we should have our eye on the ball here. Uh, and, uh, but we may be so fixated on one issue that, uh, that all of a sudden, uh, we lose the whole intent of why we're here. And the reason for the, for the farm bill is to ensure that we have an adequate food supply for this, for this uh, country and that it be efficient and safe. Uh, going to my first question is, uh, how much you know, you talk about what you're dealing with here. Uh, we, we uh, well, uh, a ranking member talked about the Build Back Better and the money involved in that. We're talking legislation this week, so eight billion dollars going to the UN for climate. What are what are we spending at USDA uh, in in dealing with climate, and how much is that raising the price of food? Have we looked at that at the grocery store? I mean, how much is that impacting the American people right now? Well, thank you, Congressman to... Allen. I'll, I'll jump in there. Uh, yeah. We see our role at the Farm Service Agency and the USDA more broadly to provide support for producers to have economic opportunity. And to the extent that that means funding some of the initiatives that will benefit them in the long term, like promoting soil health, which also has the added benefit of sequestering carbon and improving our climate outcomes. 
that's going to improve production over the, over the long haul, and it's going to help producers have more economic freedom in order to be partners in whatever initiatives the federal government decides to roll out. As to whether or not our efforts are directly impacting the price of inputs, I think there are other supply chain, supply chain issues that are impacting that, and the work at the broader USDA is trying to address some of those challenges. At the Farm uh, Service is, Agency, I'm sorry, sir, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, what we need to do is we need to figure out, one, you know, all of a sudden uh, in this new administration, it's all about climate, and we're seeing food prices skyrocket. And so uh, I just need to know, you know, uh, you know, I need to know what this is going to cost. <laughs> And because uh, the people out there are asking me, they say, what the heck is going on in this country? And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. But I'd like to specifically ask a question about the CRP program. Uh, you know, right now, uh, the biggest problem in that program is flexibility. Uh, you know, every request that my office has made, uh, say, for example, if you want to uh, exchange uh, this property for another piece of property and stay in the program, uh, it's been denied. There's absolutely no flexibility. And of course, as you know, things change, uh, property values change and that sort of thing. You're in this program 10 to 15 years. Why, why don't we have flexibility in that program? Well, sir, I would offer that I haven't heard a producer ask me about exchanging properties. We'll look into that. I know the secretary has charged us with finding as much flexibility as, that we can within our existing authorities to benefit producers. So I will definitely check yeah. on that. Well, I, I have a, a, a constituent that has offered to put twice as much, much property in CRP, which obviously helps with uh, carbon sequestration, which is obviously, you know, trees need carbon to live. And uh, in each case, uh, they've taken it to the state board and they've turned, denied their request. Uh, so uh, yeah, if, if you could get with our office and uh, let's address this problem and see if something can be done, uh, that would be uh, most appreciated. Uh, as far as the, uh, the other thing that I was going to address is the uh, uh, it, it, the uh, control swine eradication and control pilot program, but I'm I'm out of time, and, uh, and hopefully somebody else will ask about that. But thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Allen uh, and Mr. Ducheneau. Thank you for your questions. I think as follow up, the full committee would be interested in. Uh, follow up to, to Mr. Allen's question in the event that we may represent constituents with similar concerns. The chair now recognizes Ms. Custer from New Hampshire for five minutes. Great, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I wanna thank Chief Cosby and Administrator Ducheneau for joining us today. This is an excellent opportunity to take stock of where we are with the conservation programs and the Farm Bill. And I was so pleased to hear President Biden and Secretary Vilsack talk this week about the potential for agriculture to be the first sector of the American economy to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions. I believe we can realize that goal by recognizing and supporting farmers and foresters for the climate smart steps they are already taking, while also being proactive in setting long-term goals for emission reduction in agriculture and incentivizing further progress toward these goals. To achieve net zero uh, agriculture emissions, the Farm Bill Conservation Programs run by NRCS and FSA are essential. And I want to thank the excellent staff on the ground in New Hampshire. Over 55,000 acres in the Granite State were enrolled in USDA conservation programs in 2020 alone, but there remains even more we can do. Just as federal farm conservation efforts were born in the 1930s as a response to the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, we must continue to grow and enhance these programs in order to confront the greatest challenging facing our planet and that's climate change as we've heard in a bipartisan basis today. To do that, we must ensure these programs are as accessible as possible to small family owned farms and forest lands. And that means reducing unnecessary or du duplicative 
regulations and reporting requirements while still maintaining integrity in the programs. 2018, in advance of the last Farm Bill, I secured passage of bipartisan legislation to exempt farmers from the confusing Sam's Dunn's registration process for NRCS. That process was mired with bureaucratic red tape and designed for billion dollar government contractors, not small family farmers who wanna utilize conservation programs to improve the environmental integrity of their farms. Chief Cosby, as we approach the next Farm Bill, I'm eager to continue efforts to streamline programs to help small farmers and foresters. And as we look at what can be done legislatively, would you comment on anything you're already doing or considering within USDA to improve accessibility to NRCS programs? And Representative Costa, thank you. And I want to let you know that I had an opportunity to work in your great state of New Hampshire back a few years ago. So thank you for the question. One of the things that we're doing is, is that we, we talk about equity and everything that we do at NRCS and USDA and also for the administration. And equity is real important. You know, I, I'm, I'm a son of a farmer from Mississippi. And in the 70s, my dad had to give up farming operations because of being denied services that he needed to keep the operation flowing. And it was a sad day for my family to give up the farming operation. I would tell you that something that I get up every morning, I work hard on, not only conservation, but making sure that every person in this country that wants to benefit from USDA program has that opportunity. And we, uh, we're looking at what are the barriers that, that exist. We're getting rid of those. Uh, and my staff knows that this is something that we need to make sure that it's happening in every program that we administer, whether it's at NRCS, FSA, the secretary has made it very clear, and also the president made it very clear, that we want to make sure that folks have an opportunity, no matter where they live, no matter where they are, uh, to participate in Farm Bill programs. Great, thank you. Shifting gears a bit, I wanted to ask about the Clean Lakes, Estuaries, and Rivers, also known as CLEAR program within the Conservation Reserve program. Conservation groups in my district have found CLEAR to be beneficial and hope to see the program expanded further, especially by making the CLEAR 30 pilot program permanent. Through this pilot, contracts awarded by FSA receive a water quality incentive and a climate smart practice incentive. Administrator Doshino, could you explain the success of the program and its current operations? Yes, ma'am, and thank you for the question. And thank you for the support for the Clear 30 initiative. As you're aware, it was initially uh, composed of a pilot program that was in the Great Lakes and Chesapeake Bay Area, Bay Area, and we took steps in June to expand that because of the popularity of the program, and it lets folks take that expiring CRP land and do something meaningful for it for a 30-year period. And I think that's a critical part of this because it gives the producer some certainty on at least some of their acreage, what assistance they're going to have, what income they're going to be able to generate while contributing to improving the waterways of the country. Thank you. And with that, I will yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes Mr. Johnson from South Dakota for five minutes. The chair now recognizes Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Hi, sorry, thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, I've got uh, some comments for uh, Mr. Duchenal. And uh, first off, I would say, sir, we're, we're lucky to have you in your role because you really do understand grazing coming from your part of the world. Uh, when I think about some of these working land CRP programs, you're going to understand the importance of them better than just about anybody. And, and I really, I should have started by thanking uh, you all because um, during the drought, the emergency uh, hang and grazing is just so incredibly important. And your team has shown a lot of flexibility and I think a lot of understanding of, of how that can be a lifeline for people when, when times get tough. But I want to talk a little bit about a, kind of a failure to launch with some of these grasslands. CRP, uh, the program, has not gone like we wanted it to after the last farm bill. So initially, sir, give me a sense of uh, any suggestions you'd have for how we could make that program more effective.
Thank you, Congressman Johnson. We think we demonstrated great success with the changes we made to the CRP grasslands program this last year. We had 2 million acres subscribed to that. A lot of those acreages were in some areas of emphasis, including the Dust Bowl country and the elk migratory corridor in Wyoming and Montana. So I think give us a little time to see how that plays out in future years. We've got some ideas about how do we get out to our underserved populations with that territory, with that program. As you're aware, some of the territory in South Dakota is operated on by Indian country, and they haven't really been partners in CRP before. CRP Grasslands is a great opportunity to get meaningful watershed level enrollment into okay. these programs that can help benefit producers in some of the most economically distressed areas in the country. And, and so what do we, I mean, just give me an idea of what that outreach might look like. So we're conducting outreach right now to talk about CREP as an alternative to enroll in some of these, the flexibilities that we've been offered in the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program to work directly with tribal governments and state governments and other non-governmental uh, partners is gonna be critical to building that public-private partnership that can really help producers have something to plan on. Sure, so, uh, and, and let's, let's talk a little bit more about working lands because I do think some of the best stewardship, uh, some of the best sustainability, some of the best habitat, uh, I mean, I just think so many really good things can come from working lands. So talk to me more about how uh, your agency views uh, working lands conservation. The, at the Farm Service Agency, we're really trying to message that all of this land is working lands conservation. Take, for instance, CRP. During the last drought disaster we had in South Dakota, a lot of that land was opened up for emergency haying and grazing to help capitalize on the reserve portion of the conservation reserve program. Now there were some challenges with the primary nesting season and the haying of the land, but we wonder, what we really wanna emphasize in coming years is that producers can stockpile some of that forage hayed after that primary nesting season. As my dad always told me, hay in the stack is like money in the bank. And if we can stockpile that through non-emergency use or make better use of it through non-emergency use, our producers are gonna be better positioned to use their other non-enrolled acreages during times of drought and other disaster. So, uh, Mr. Ducheneau, I've got some folks back home who are talking to me about concerns that we may be headed toward what we saw maybe 10 years ago, where there was a sense that uh, some of the incentive payments and, and some of the land rates were really competing against young producers who were interested in getting into farming. Uh, what, do, help me understand a little bit. Do you think that that's a legitimate concern? What should I tell those folks? Well, sir, I think there are some limits built into it. Uh, one, of the, one of the major limiting factors in having this be real competition is that there's a 25% acreage limit on a county by county basis. So that leaves 75% of the other land in that county to, to adjust to the market. But you won't find a bigger champion in the, in, in the department for young and beginning farmers than myself. I still identify as one, even though when I walk up those stairs, I don't feel like one. <laughs> so I think we've, you know, we're really going to focus on how do we build those connections. You know, we've got the transition incentives program within CRP that really never gained any traction. So we're looking at how we can improve that program to make that connection with that next generation, sir. So well said, uh, thanks for your service. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes Mr. O'Halloran from Arizona for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, ranking member and uh, the panelists really appreciate your presentations. I'm pleased that we are conducting a review of the conservation programs. These programs are critical to rural Arizona and rural America, particularly programs that help protect and restore land and water. As wildfire season has become longer and wildfires have become more dangerous and unfortunately more deadly. The Natural Conservation Service plays a important role in replanting and, and improving the land following, following the wildfire burn scars. In 2019, the museum fire forced neighborhoods to evacuate and the cost more than $9, $9 million to control. It was only a little less than 2,000 acre fire. 
it has also left a burn scar in its wake. Now, several neighborhoods in Flagstaff face severe flooding. These are not neighborhoods that had been at risk of localized flooding before the fire. And there will be several years, it appears, before they are fully restored. Post-museum fire flooding highlights the need for NRCS to have the ability to work on forest service lands. These are improvements that are supported by local governments in my district who know the resources and expertise provided by NRCS will help reduce flooding, replant trees, and restore the burn scars. And Chief, I know that uh, you're in the process of working on that right now and appreciate it very much. So Chief, uh, thank you for being here and for your testimony today. Can you discuss how NRCS resources are currently used to address fire burn scars in the aftermath of wildfire? I understand there are several examples and are there potential ways to improve interagency collaboration uh, with agencies like the Forest Service or BLM to better improve resilience to wildfires? And thank you for the question, sir. And to, you know, a big share of the land across this country is in private ownership, and we know that uh, when there's fires, it doesn't stop at the fence. And we know that uh, we have problems on public land also. I have a very good working relationship with the Chief of the Forest Service, and we have been having meetings and talking about how can the NRCS help with not only private land, but on the public side of the fence also. And that's where uh, we have something called the Joint Chiefs Initiative, that the, the Chief of the Forest Service and the Chief of the NRCS look at how we can work together, and, and NRCS works on the private side of the fence, and the Forest Service works on the public side of the fence. Uh, we are also looking at how we can look in, in some of these watersheds to see how we can work together to restore that. Uh, we also have uh, plant material centers around this country where we are developing new species of plants and, 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 and we know that we have uh, tools in our, in our toolbox to help with a lot of those areas that need to be reforestated or even uh, planted back to grass. So we are consulting very closely with the Forest Service and the Chief Moore and I have a very good positive working relationship and we're going to continue to do that because we understand that public-private plays, you know, plays a very important part and we have to look at how we can make sure there are not resource concerns not only on, on private land but we need to be looking at the resource concerns on public land also. Well, thank you Chief. I highlighted that one fire but I've had several in the district just in the past year that uh, I appreciate all the work you're doing towards that process. Uh, Mr. Ducheneau, uh, Administrator, uh, thank you for your testimony today. I commend you on your being the first uh, Native American FSA Administrator, and thank you for all your work so far and your work in the past. Under your leadership, what action is being taken uh, to ensure that FSA resources are being used to improve conservation outcomes in underserved communities, particularly Indian country? Thank you, Congressman O'Halloran. I do have to give a little praise to the NRCS in this regard because they have been leading in delivery of conservation programs in Indian country. The CSP program was one of the most valuable tools that many of the producers in our communities have ever seen. But what the FSA is doing now with regard to the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, having someone that knows intimately the issues that are facing tribal producers as they try to enroll in these conservation programs at the head of the agency with partnerships across in the Department of Interior to try to be able to work out more meaningful and implementable solutions is going to be critical in delivering services to those communities, sir. Thank you very much, and I yield, Madam Chair. The chair, the chair now recognizes Mr. Desjardins for five minutes. Thank you, and uh, thanks to our witnesses today. Uh, our farmers and ranchers have been unfairly labeled as climate criminals by some, and that could not be further from the truth. Uh, what is the USDA doing today to recognize and promote awareness among the general public that our American farmers, ranchers, and foresters are already effectively doing, doing uh, uh, to be climate heroes and in increasing sequestration of greenhouse gases through their everyday agricultural practices? And I'll, I'll start for NRCS, and I'll turn it over to Administrator Ducino. 
I would tell you that as we work with landowners across the country, we know that uh, private uh, landowners are the best for conservation. You know, these farmers out there, they have a lot of challenges. They, they, work that, they work the land. They know the challenges that they're facing. And they're the best advocate for themselves. Also, as our staff work with them, we, we advocate for that also. Uh, when we are out writing conservation plans for producers across the country, we look at uh, resource needs and resource issues. And producers have a good, pretty good idea of, of how to fix a lot of these resource problems. And we're able to offer some, some financial assistance to help them through that. And so as we administer these Farm Bureau programs, we'll continue to talk about uh, producers and farmers and far, forest landowners as being champions. And uh, USDA wants to be a champion right alongside of them. OK. And thank you. let me ask a, another question. Um, we want to make sure that uh, in this Farm Bill, the conservation title does not become the climate title. Farm Bill conservation programs have garnered bipartisan support in Congress and are popular with farmers and ranchers. That popularity stems from farmers and ranchers having the ability to address natural resource concerns that are specific to their individual farms. I also believe these programs work because of the locally led component where local work groups and state technical committees prioritize the practices that are important to their region or state. What I have concern with is turning the conservation title into the climate title. For example, post-harvest flooding rice fields provides innumerable benefits to wildlife, but might not score high in climate-dominated ranking systems. I also worry about some crops like wheat that can't always take advantage of cover crop incentives. Uh, to both witnesses, will you pledge to support this long-held model of locally-led incentive-based conservation system rather than refocusing Title II as a climate title? Sir, I, I will start with that, and I will tell you that the local led process is something that we wholeheartedly support. Um, from my time in the field as a, tech, as a soil conservationist and also as a, a district conservationist, and then as a state conservationist, the locally led process really works. We had, we had meetings in all the counties out there to talk about what the least local resource issues were, and then they filtered it up to, to factor into how a lot of these programs work at the state level. And then working alongside the State Technical Committee, which is a very important uh, group of folks from all segments of society. And they sat along with myself uh, when I was a state conservationist and also the FSA director and talk about, from a statewide perspective, how should these programs work. So it worked, building it up from the local and then marrying it at the state and also looking at what are the national priorities. So when we look at this, we talk about local priorities, we talk about state priorities, and then we talk about national priorities, and that has worked. Okay. Uh, my district is home to the famous Jack Daniels Distillery and several other hardworking distilleries. White oak trees are crucial to the industry for making their world-famous barrels, and unfortunately the industry is in worsening shortage. Uh, the last thing they need and so many others in agriculture is more regulations. There's a lot of fear about tax provisions such as the stepped up basis program, which is critical to ensuring the generational family farms remain intact, uh, could be going away. Can you talk about what the department is doing to ensure these producers are supported? Thank you, Congressman Dejelay. We, at the department and specifically in the Farm Service Agency, we see our role, as I've stated, to support producers and ensure that they have enough of their production income left at the end of the year so that they can make choices. We see the 3.4 million ag producers out there in the country as champions of the in initiatives that the administration is touting. More and better markets, climate smart solutions, recovery from the pandemic, and improving access for the next generation. If we don't have producers that have production income in their pocket at the end of the production year, that next generation isn't going to be interested anyway. Thank you. That's pretty much all the time I have. Thank you both, and I yield back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Panetta for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Chief Cosby, as well as uh, Administrator Ducano, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your testimony. And of course, thank you for your work on the federal conservation programs. Um, as you've testified, uh, obviously these types of programs have played a vital role throughout our nation's agricultural history. And let me tell you, they helped a lot in my district on the Central Coast of California in which they've protected farmland 
and obviously help develop effective, effective conservation practices that have benefited not just our farms, but our farm workers and our food for sure. Now on the central coast of California, we got a lot of diversity when it comes to what type of crops we grow over a hundred specialty crops, as I'm sure both of you know. And therefore, um, some of the challenges uh, are, are when it comes to conservation practices, because one size doesn't fit all, unfortunately, in my district, but fortunately for its diversity, uh, which helps them out. Now, that being said, obviously, I do believe that's why it's so important to, to ensure that, uh, and I achieve it bestly, especially what you, just said, what you just said, that especially crop producers and people at the local level uh, are at the table in this con con conversation, especially when it comes to conservation. Um, and Administrator Ducano, you obviously um, understand this, uh, and I say that based on, in chief, so do you, but especially the administrator, and I say that personally, uh, because you have someone working for you, Ria Meta, who understands how important it is to have everybody at the table. As you know, she was a former employee of mine and damn good one. And uh, good on you for uh, having her work for you, but also good for our agriculture uh, and good for our specialty crops on the Central Coast, knowing that she's still working on programs like this. So thank you. Thank you very much, and Mr. <coughs> now, let me talk about specialty crops, or at least let me ask you a question about them, especially when it comes to the climate smart commodity. I thought, I thought it was come here, yeah. Uh, obviously, you know that that's funded by the Commodity Credit Corp. And can you explain how specialty crops are included in the Climate Smart Commodities Initiative? And uh, Administrator, I'll go ahead and, and put that first one to you. Uh, thank you, Congressman, and thank you for not taking to me too hard for stealing your good staff. I agree, she's top notch. Since yeah. I've got to the agency, and this maybe was going on long before, we've engaged with very diverse stakeholder groups. We've had several groups from the specialty crop arena giving us input on program construction instead of us going out there and saying, here's the programs we're doing, figure out how to fit in. We're bringing them in at the front end of these conversations. So by definition, whatever we do with regard to the CCC funding that we're gonna have an opportunity to deploy is gonna have taken into account the needs of those specialty crop producers. One of the other aspects of the work that we do that really isn't tailored to fit specialty or organic crops is our farm loan programs. And we're working very diligently with those groups to try to find a way to craft those tools to better suit their needs so they're not so reliant on the small segmented parts of the work that we get to do to suit their industry. Great, thank you. Chief, you have anything to add to that? Just a little bit on the locally led. It's very important that, you know, especially when we have local conditions, uh, it's very important that we have the local folks at the table to talk about what those resource issues are and what those resource needs are. And then our folks are able to look at and say, hey, let, let's, let's sit down, let's write this conservation plan, let's look at, let's walk the land, let's talk about the crops that you're growing, how can we solve the resource issues and, and, and also make sure it's beneficial to your bottom line. And so that's what's so great about the NRCS team. We're able to look at whatever is growing there and take that in consideration when we're writing that conservation plan. Great, thank you, Chief. Now, um, in regards to cover, cover crops, obviously, especially crops kind of have a little bit more difficult to time applying these types of cover crops uh, and for some sort of conservation practices. Now, I know there's a proposal, and you know there's a proposal for a nationwide pandemic cover crop um, in, incentive, uh, the pandemic cover crop program that's out there. Uh, it, uh, Mr. Administrator, how will the FSA work with the RM RMA to administer this? We work very closely with Administrator Bunger on that, and we were partners in delivering that program last year we were expecting 2 million acres and we enrolled nearly 14 million acres in that pandemic cover crop uh, program. So I think the need is there and you've got the commitment of myself and Administrator Bunger to work together. She brings the added benefit of having been a county executive director for us in the past. Outstanding, thank you. My time is up, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Moore for five minutes. Yes, 
Um, Mr. Moore, you might be muted. I apologize, Madam Chair. I thought I hit the button. I guess it didn't go through. We can hear you uh, now. Thank you. Okay, very good. Chief Cosby, uh, what is the staffing capacity level that you need to effectively implement the Farm Bill conservation programs and to provide needed technical assistance? And where are you currently compared to that number? And uh, last, will the administration request a level you think in the near future to, to meet the needs? And Representative Moore, thank you for the question. You know, we, we have a very aggressive hiring strategy. Last year, also, we had direct hire authority where we were able to um, take resumes and bring on a very capable staff to NRCS. Over the last two years, we've hired about 3,000 employees, and over the next two years, um, hopefully we'll be able to bring on the same. We are well above our attrition rate uh, as people leave the agency for retirement. Uh, we've been able to maintain our numbers. We're at 10,300 right now. Our, our, our number is a little over 11,000 that we can staff up to, and we're going to make that number this year. But uh, we are working very closely with our state conservationists and our folks across the country to figure out what, what is the talent that we need, what, what is the skill set that we need, and we're looking at hiring those individuals with those types of skill sets that's needed, so best needed across the country out in those field offices across the, the nation. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kyle's being with that. Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes Ms. Schreier for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome Chief Cosby, Administrator Ducheneau. Um, I'd like to touch on a few challenges with conservation programs that farmers and growers in Washington State have been experiencing, and I I hope USDA can help with these. Um, the first is simply the lack of staffing at local USDA offices, which is impacting uh, USDA's ability to meet the demand of farmers who want to participate in farm bill conservation programs. And um, I should just mention um, the, the, the desire is there. I, I heard from some of my colleagues about uh, not hearing about this. Um, I am thinking specifically, for example, right now of Degetti Farms uh, that has a hydroponic uh, facility. This is all um, an equip uh, uh, supported uh, um, uh, endeavor that has uh, solar panels and rainwater catch basins that is saving a ton of money and increasing yield. Um, but it turns out that, you know, the local offices that help farmers on the ground um, are, are simply not staffed. And so this puts undue burden on local conservation districts to fill in the gaps, and they're already strained by demand. So, for example, this last year in Pierce County, Washington, uh, the conservation did 90 percent of the work to get farmers enrolled in EQIP. And I know things are improving, but I just wanted to emphasize that need for local staffing. Um, the second challenge uh, is that while the EQIP program generally works well once it's implemented, boy, the paperwork and the bureaucracy is really overly burdensome. And the timelines from application to implementation is frustratingly long. And so I would ask you to please work on streamlining the process to make it more accessible. And of course, I know that some of that depends on meeting that first request, which is more staffing. And then um, the, the third has to do with funding and that there's just simply not enough funding for these programs. Um, only 30% of the farmers who applied for EQIP contracts in, in my district uh, were awarded them. And reimbursement rates are also a problem. They're insufficient, particularly in places like King County and Pierce County. Uh, in my district where land is so expensive that compensation for sacrificing working farmland needs to be much higher to incentivize conservation. So I'll work on increasing overall funding uh, to meet the need, both the need of farmers for financial viability and access to these programs and the need for more conservation programs in general. But I would ask you to consider land value in uh, determining how to compensate farmers for opting into conservation programs, because if that doesn't happen, farmland's gonna turn into housing, which is in high demand and can bring huge financial reward to farmers who sell to developers rather than conserving the land. And 
In addition, I would say there shouldn't be a restriction that blocks farmers from selling any of their land for development. For example, we should still incentivize conserving part of the land, even if they sell the rest. So um, it, Chief Cosby, I just was wondering if you could comment about what we can do here and what your plans are to ensure that farmers who want to participate in USDA programs are able to do so and are incentivized to do so. And thank you for the question, and I'll try to hit on a couple of those that, that, that you mentioned. And, and staffing, um, as I mentioned before, that we do have a very aggressive staffing uh, model that we're, we're implementing. We're hiring staff out across the country. We have a very capable state conservationist in the Washington State, and we'll be working with her to make sure that um, you know she has the right uh, staffing for, for her state. Also, uh, on the EQIP, and, and one of the things that we are working on is making these programs a little more transparent. And also, um, we are working very hard in, in each of the states to have outreach coordinators that will be working, that will be reaching out to producers to help them better understand how these programs work, uh, how do you apply, how do you go through the whole process. One of the other things that we did this year is we gave states their budget in October. And so they have 12 months. Uh, this year to make sure they, they get folks in the door and also work through the process. And we also have a website uh, at, at, on USDA.gov uh, that talks about all of the sign-up periods across the country. It's one website. And so producers that farm regionally or farm out at farm across state lines are able to go in and look at what those dates are. And I just want to remind everyone that for most of our program, it is a year-around sign-up period. Uh, 365 days, and if you don't make it then, uh, we'll defer that application until the next year. So it is 365 days, and we encourage folks to come in and sign up. And if there's any misconceptions there, just reach out to that local staff. Also on the funding side, uh, your state is no different than, than the rest of the country. We're only able to fund about a third of the applications that walk through the door, and it's a very competitive process and we want to make sure that folks understand what that process is and how to apply. And we, we are making it so that it's not by farm size or anything like that. Uh, when we look at our ranking system, we're trying to make it more flexible so that anyone that wants to participate and is going to do some great conservation work has that opportunity. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Schreier. And to conclude our first round, and if the witnesses are able, we would uh, enjoy doing a second round. To conclude our first round is Ranking Member LaMalfa. Mr. LaMalfa, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, phoning in from home here today, so uh, thank you for letting me work around things uh, under the weather a little bit. But as you see, the Pomeranian just uh, woke up here this morning at the house, so... <laughs> <laughs> that all said, um, thank you for this hearing. And GT, thanks for sitting in in the number two chair there. And uh, just had a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Cosby here quick. Um, uh, you know, up here in Northern California, obviously we've been victim of an incredible amount of wildfire the last several years, but, you know, more years than that, really. Just they're getting bigger and bigger. So one of the common concerns we're hearing from uh, – uh, landowners up here is that uh, to re reduce wildfire risk is we have a lack of forester capacity, you know, boots on the ground, so to speak, right? So some states have very few foresters on half to on behalf on on hand to do the work. So, Chief, what what is NRCS doing to uh, try and boost that number up and help address this very important problem that um, we're seeing because of? Uh, just flat staffing numbers. We're seeing a lot of frustration with COVID closures as well. And uh, what, what can we be doing or, or what, what are you strategizing that uh, we can do that to implement more, more of these practices to protect our communities and other barriers that are standing in the way of forest, uh, forest management? Congressman, uh, last year, the State Conservationist of California identified uh, a great forestry need of foresters and one of the things that he did was a uh, uh, representative of his staff that he brought on out there were, were foresters, and we've identified that need across the country. And so last year we were able to bring on uh, numerous foresters, and as we look at how do we move through this next round of hiring, we're also looking at that need. 
Also, we do have uh, men and women from other agencies, like state agencies and, 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 and other groups that, are, that have helped us with this over the years. But we uh, saw that we internally we need to have more forces on staff, so we're in the process of doing that. But we were able to bring on several last year, and we will be bringing on several this next year. Thank you. And I think you kind of touched on my next thought here on uh, we're calling regional flexibility. Different regions have different uh, concerns and unique uh, needs. So are the, are the programs flexible enough to allow that kind of uh, practices between regions and, and different needs? Is, is there not ability to move people around or resources around to um, meet each region's unique needs? Is there something we need to be doing to help give that flexibility? to uh, move personnel or have the programs work um, from one, one region to the next where you have u unique landscapes, et cetera. And I think we've built that flexibility into most of our programs. As we talked before, we talk about the local led process where folks on the local level get together, talk about what the resource needs are. And also then we look at statewide, what are those resource needs? And then nationally, what are the resource needs? And we try to marry those and make sure we have a balanced approach when we're implementing these programs. So that is already baked into the pie. And, uh, and so we're happy about that. And the folks on the local level and at the state level have a lot of flexibility when it comes to these programs, working through and with the state technical committee and all the groups out there that make up that state technical committee. Okay, and lastly, and I'll call you back, but is that the COVID closures, again, are really making it difficult to get timely assistance through uh, the con conservation programs in certain areas. Some of the offices in my district are just having a devil of a time, uh, folks getting in there to get things signed up, et cetera. So I hope we can um, release release more people and have more flexible hours under the COVID closures. And so, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll yield back. Thank you very much to the ranking member uh, I, and to the witnesses. Thank you for your efficiency in answering questions. I think we've made great time and answered um, a, a wide array of questions. So with that, I'd like to move forward with a second round um, and I'll recognize myself first for five minutes. Um, I, I wanted to begin by just commenting on the comments from uh, my colleague, Mr. Desjardins who talked about our producers being climate heroes, and I could not agree with him more. And certainly I have heard from producers in my district uh, the challenge that they sometimes feel like they're positioned to seem like, as to use Mr. Desjardins' term, uh, climate criminals. And so I am really excited about the work that this subcommittee does and certainly the work of your agencies because I think that it does affirm um, what my colleague from Tennessee said, which is our farmers and producers are the original conservationists and they are the climate heroes. And so I'm, I'm I, in, in being really um, forward leaning and hearing some of the comments from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, there's the discussion of making sure that the conservation title stays the conservation title and not the climate title. Um, and, and I think I would just note that there's real great value in seeing all of the benefits of these incredible programs. Um, as chair of the Conservation and Forestry Subcommittee and as the only Virginian on the Ag Committee and as someone who has been uh, daydreaming of working on a farm bill since I first arrived in Congress, I do look forward to continuing to strengthen the conservation title, but recognizing that it has real benefits and value uh, to our climate, but also to our farmers and producers. So to that end, I'd like to begin with you, Mr. Deschanel, to follow up a little bit on a, a, a line of answers that you were giving earlier, where you know some of us have really been talking a lot about the climate benefits of these different programs, right? That's an exciting element of these programs. But I was wondering if you could explain a bit more, and Mr. Cosby, I welcome you to follow suit. Can you explain a little bit more why farmers and producers want to be a part of this program. And so, you know, while we call them conservation programs, they have climate value. They also have economic value to our rural communities and our producers. So could you maybe walk me through what's the financial gain or the benefit to our nation's producers of these programs? Thank you, Madam Chair. Conservation equals soil health. Soil health equals Im improved production. And the fact of the matter is that According to the last time the ERS tabulated the data, only 7 to 14 cents 
of the food dollar are getting back to the producers. So we have to find a way to improve income streams for producers so that they have the capability to join us in the fight to sequester carbon and mitigate climate change. And I think that it's important that we include them in the conversations very early on as to what is climate smart, what is climate change mitigation strategies. And we've done that through a couple of different requests for input, getting hundreds of comments from diverse stakeholders, big ag companies, and the like, so that we know what we're going forward into is going to be beneficial all the way across the ag industry. To just dig into that a little bit more, and I open this up to either one of you, you know, your experience is on the ground. What are the what are the financial benefits? What are the cost savings? What does it mean for a farmer or producer to actually participate in this program from an economic standpoint of their day-to-day -day operation? Uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, take our CRP grasslands program, for instance. That lets the producer get into an NRCS-approved plan, continue to have the same level of production, but also be able to quantify the amount of increased production that they are generating. So then in addition to getting a rental payment, they're also getting added production out of their existing resources. So in, in layman's terms, rental payment equals income incoming. Increased yep. production is they're producing more that they can sell. Exactly, yep. Mr. Cosby? And man, we could talk all day about this topic and I'd, I'd love to have this conversation because it's exciting uh, to be part of conservation. And you know, when we work with producers out on the land, it, it's, 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 it's just great to see the enthusiasm they have for conservation. And they want to do the right thing. And they will do the right thing if they have the right information. And my agency is a science-based agency, and we, everything we do is science-based. And, and just the benefits of soil health, you know, having that healthy soil and being able to raise that crop and, 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 and looking at the profitability from that, the resiliency of, of these farms out there is it, outstanding. And when you look at most of the programs that we administer, you look at the co-benefits of all of the things that we do from water quality to, 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 to quantity and quality, also for wildlife habitat and, and, and some of the great things that are happening around this country on working lands when we have that wildlife benefit. It, it is exciting to see farmers react to that and want to do the right things. And we can, you know, we can do all those things in a way that, that sustains farms. Sustainability is, is big for a lot of farmers. And I, I just wish my dad was here today to see some of these things that are happening and, and be a part of the excitement around agriculture. It is very exciting to work in agriculture right now. Thank you very much. So to uh, the colleagues on this subcommittee, you know, whether we get to the table because we're super excited about uh, conservation related climate smart benefits or climate benefits, whether we get to the table because it's so exciting to see that we can help ensure that farmers stay on their land or whether or not we get to the table to uh, put extra dollars in the pockets of our farmers and producers. Uh, as the current and uh, planning future chair of the subcommittee, that table is going to continue to be the conservation title. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that all of the reasons that bring us to the table um, have us here working on behalf of our producers. Uh, with that, I now recognize Mr. LaMalfa for an additional five minutes. All right, Mr. LaMalfa, we'll come back to you um, in the future. Uh, Mr. Thompson, would you like an additional five minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, gentlemen, thank you to both of you. And this question actually is for both of you. Give you an opportunity to weigh in as we really begin to build out the framework for the 2023 Farm Bill. Um, and I'll start with Administrator uh, Ducheneau. Uh, can you, uh, it'll be the same question for both of you. Can, can you explain about your individual agency perspectives on the 2018 Farm Bill program implementation strengths and opportunities for improvement? Yes, sir, and thank you for the question. When I came on board in February, there were several things that had their, had their origins in the 2018 Farm Bill that hadn't quite made it across the finish line. So we're really interested in making sure that those get out there and make a meaningful impact so that we have something to evaluate as we have our future conservation conversations, sir. Uh, one of them is the Heirs Properties Relending Program. That hadn't really moved any yet. 
and we're happy to announce that we've got that out and we've got some prospects in the pipeline to help deal with, deal with the heirs property issues all across the south and all across the Indian, Indian country. Another aspect of that 2018 implementation is, for example, the CLEAR expansion and the CREP expansion, finding that flexibility and then deploying that flexibility so that we have meaningful information to make future decisions on is really critical, sir. Very good. Chief Cosby, same, kind of the same question. Yes, from the NRCS side, I think, what, you know, I've talked about a little bit that we were able to make sure our states had their budget in early October, and that provided uh, 12 months out of the year for them to do planning, and I think that extends the season that we have to work for producers. Also, when we look at our programs, um, we talk about CSP. We've been able to modify that to talk about in that fifth year, if a producer um, doesn't have an opportunity to, to re-enroll, they do can come right back and not have to set out for the two-year period. And when we talk about EQIP, you know, we're looking at how do we make it more flexible? How do we make sure that anyone that wants to benefit from the programs? And that's where the money that the $50 million that we put out across the country comes in uh, really strong is that we're able to make sure that anyone that wants to walk through the door benefits from USDA programs. They have that knowledge and that experience and we're able to work with community-based organizations and universities and a lot of folks across the country to make sure folks understand how these programs work because they do get a little complicated at times and we want to make sure they have that opportunity to participate. And so we're, we've been looking at the flexibilities of all of our programs, and we've been working through those, uh, RCPP, uh, the flexibility that we've built there. So that's something from day one that we've been doing um, because we want producers to be able to participate without, you know, barriers. Very good. Well, thank you to both of you. And Madam Chair, I yield back. The chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Pingree for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and again, thank you to our witnesses for being here and all of your uh, very helpful uh, answers to our questions. Um, Mr. Cosby, I'm, I'm coming back to you again, and um, I just want to ask a little bit about composting as a conservation practice. So I've been interested in this for a long time and pushing NRCS to adopt composting as a conservation practice for several years. Um, but I was encouraged to hear that interim, the interim soil carbon amendment process, which includes compost and biochar, was beginning to be rolled out last year. So could you give me an update on the soil carbon amendment practice and where and how it has been used so far? I would tell you, it's something that we're pretty excited about, especially when you talk about the standard and also as it applies to our urban folks also, when you talk about food waste and, and, and composting. That, that standard is working its way through the process, and we're hoping to be able to uh, release it real soon. It, it's pretty, it's very important, it, it, you know, when you start talking about uh, soil amendments and some of those type things, but we are, it is working through the process and hopefully we'll be able to uh, have that out the door really soon. And are there some places that it is being used? You know, we, we put in interim standards uh, when, when we do this, and so we're able to use those interim standards until they are fully vetted and, 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 and finalized. So there are some places that are being used, and, and we're also doing studies on that to make sure that we hit the mark when we do release it finally. But we do uh, develop interim standards for everything that goes through this process. Great. Well, I'm glad that's um, coming out soon, and I'll, I'll look forward to seeing that. Um, I, I ran out of time in my last question, so I just want to reinforce the, the issue I was bringing up about PFAS and um, encourage you, and I'm happy to follow up with this, uh, to have NRCS doing more, um, supporting more of the soil testing. Um, uh, I know that you help with soil testing to a certain extent, but the original language was really to have EQIP be used um, to identify and deal with contaminants. And again, because PFAS is a growing problem, because the costs of testing are um, challenging for farmers, um, it seems to me we could use this more as a tool. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I certainly, I will follow up to, to encourage that is a possibility that it could be used. Ma'am, I'd, I'd like to visit more with you about this and hopefully we can follow up after this this hearing and we can work through it and we can look at what the recommendations are and work with your staff to get to a place where we can support our farmers in, in your state. 
Um, great. Well, thank you for that. And uh, again, thank you for being with us today. And we'll, we'll be chatting with you in the future. So thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, I, we see uh, we have two remaining members. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. LaMalfa and then Mr. Allen. Mr. LaMalfa, you're recognized for five minutes. Thanks again, Madam Chair. Um, to both of our witnesses, I was wondering how um, something Mr. O'Halloran had touched upon on uh, our the fo post fire projects and uh, how how are how are these uh, watershed uh, protections and such coming under coming along as we uh, you know we we had a, a incredible amount of rain and snowfall in Northern California here immediately after the end of the fire season and it's uh, you know we had a giant washout that took it now took out one of our state highways for weeks, but also the, the great concern is about what's that going to do for our waterways is uh, basically my district is the, uh, is the well for a lot of the rest of the state. And uh, so we need to, we need to be sure that we're advancing this watershed protection and conservation, et cetera. So um, how, how is it, how are they coming along in your view at this point here? Do you have what you need? Are, are people moving at a swift pace to try and uh, get ahead of, you know, again, over a million acres worth of, uh, of damage? And I'll start for NRCS. So we'll let you know that the watershed program is one of our oldest programs that we administer and we've had great success. And, you know, one of the things on planning and uh, on some of these watersheds, we do have a 225,000 acre limitation unless uh, written uh, by you folks to say that we can waive that. Uh, under, under our flood prevention, we do have uh, our emergency watershed program. Uh, it does work very well. Uh, we have had a number of requests in for things like debris removal and log jams and some of those type things. And so the staff is receiving those requests. When we, get, when, when we receive those in the field, we go out and do a, a disaster survey to look at what the impacts are on the land, and then those come in for funding as we have funding. Funding is limited, um, and so the staff do work through that to make sure that it happens. And then on the rehab side, we, we, have, we do have some dams out there that have lived past its life expectancy and we have pipes that are rusting, and so we are looking at those and seeing how we can go in and re rehab those dams. And so the, the process is working very well. Uh, most, it is a sponsor-led program where the sponsors contact us and they do a lot of the work and then we come in with financial assistance to help w with that. So the program is working well, um, and so we hopefully we can continue that. Well, thank you. Also, you mentioned the what's called the Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration Partnership that uh, NRCS works with Forest Service on. We have several of those projects underway in my own district, and one called the Butte, Butte Valley South Landscape Restoration. Can you talk a little more about the work on these projects and the benefits you're seeing with the collaboration with the partnership? What what does that uh, what does that do to enhance from what that we hadn't had before? It is a great partnership, and as a state conservationist, I had an opportunity to work with the Forest Service on the Wayne National Forest in southern Ohio. And, you know, we have uh, private land dispersed in, in and around public land, and a lot of times um, there was work being done on public land that should have been done on private land also. And so it works very well when we are able to partner with the Forest Service to look and ask them where they're going to be working, and then we're able to contact those landowners in and around that area that they're going to be working in, and we can offer conservation planning assistance, we can offer financial assistance, so that once the work on, on public land is done, we can also achieve the same benefits on private land, especially when you get into things like trim uh, timber stand improvements or, you know, like grapevine removal and some of these things that encroach on other areas. And so we're, it's been a great collaboration between the two agencies, the Forest Service, and we continue, to, we hope that continues. We know it will continue. We don't hope it continues. We know it will continue. Uh, like I said, we have a great working relationship with the chief at the Forest Service. Thank you, Chief Cosby and Madam Chair. Thank you. I will yield back to you. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Allen, for five minutes. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, and Chief Cosby, let's go back to uh, the, the the announcement of the uh, funding of projects for the feral swine eradication and control pilot program. 
Can you update the committee on the status of these projects? Yeah, and and thank you, sir, for the question. And we've been involved. It is a, pro a program where we, um, the money is is, is uh, embedded to uh, other agencies to carry out. Uh, you know, we help with things like uh, trapping and some, but we do not um, provide money to actually exterminate those those, those, those animals. Uh, it's, it's been it's been really popular in the southern part of the country. I know as as the feral hogs move uh, further, I know we'll be probably getting into more of that. But it's been very popular. It's worked very well for us to work with those agencies like APHIS and some of the rest of them to transfer those dollars to help with this. And we know it is a problem. Uh, and, and obviously, it continues to be a problem. Will there be additional projects announced and funding in the coming year? We, we hope so. We're, we'll take that back and take a look at it. And as we uh, look at uh, programs and how they're funded, we will take that under consideration. Okay. And uh, on the uh, administrator, going back to the, the climate thing, and of course you mentioned that the farmers only get like seven to 10 cents of the value of, of that. Uh, and of course, uh, have we looked at, uh, from the standpoint of the of this carbon initiative, uh, you know, how much, uh, how much production uh, land have we taken out of, of the equation? Uh, and, and is that dry, could that be a, a possibility of the, maybe the shortages we're seeing or the, the, the increase in food prices? Thank you for the question, sir. I don't necessarily think that's a factor. I, because it's a voluntary incentive-based program and we're really emphasizing the working lands aspect of our conservation reserve programs, we hope producers take a look at that as an opportunity to, to stockpile feed or food stuff for the future use and capitalize on that as an asset. You know, there's a growing movement in the climate industry that's talking about soil wealth as opposed to soil health and how do you start to quantify the improved value of your real estate when you're, when you're engaging in these practices? And exactly. to that, yes, sir. Yeah, well, you know, here's, what, here's what we need to get to the bottom of. One is, obviously, to do some of these initiatives, we're using taxpayers' money to do that, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So we're using the taxpayers' dollars to do that, but then, the result of that is we have these empty grocery shelves and we have uh, uh, inflation as far as the food source is concerned. Input costs have gone out the roof. Uh, you know, I think uh, what efforts is USDA doing to get to research and get to the bottom of what the heck is going on and uh, in this uh, uh, economic situation, and, and really it's, uh, it's a crisis uh, that we've got to deal with. Uh, where are you on that and, and what, are you, what are you trying to do uh, to explain what the heck's going on? Sir, I've not done any research on that, but I'll visit with our folks at the Economic Research Service and see if there is anything that they've got and get in touch with your office on that. But I, I don't think that the the, it's necessarily a cause and effect relationship that the assistance that we provide with taxpayer resources allocated to us through congressional action is the driver of higher food prices because it sure isn't getting back to the producers. No, and, that, and see, that's, the, that's what the, my point is. Where's the money going? <laughs> I will we'll do some research, sir, and get back to you. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful to our committee, particularly when we're uh, looking at the new farm bill, because that is, you know, that that whole farm bill is an economic project to ensure that Americans have a safe and efficient food source. And, uh, and in fact, that's what this committee needs to uh, be laser focused on. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. And uh, Chairman, that uh, ends, uh, I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Before we adjourn today, I invite the ranking member of the full Agriculture Committee to share any closing comments he may have. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for this hearing. Uh, 
uh, Chief Administrator, thank you both uh, for, for being with us here today. As we work towards uh, the uh, uh, 2023 Farm Bill, uh, we, we know that uh, you know, we, we, we have a lot of responsibility. And that means doing great oversight and learning lessons of what we were able to put into a, what looks like a very successful 2018 Farm Bill. And so as we work towards restoring a robust rural economy um, and, um, and really creating the conditions in, in rural America where we begin to re rebuild our population, um, you know, this was, uh, this was a great start on the con uh, conversation today, specifically within the jurisdiction of, of your, your two uh, agencies. And so uh, thank you for that. This is a, a great start. We look forward to uh, continue this conversation so that we are in a position to, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, at the, uh, when, uh, when we get that 2023 Farm Bill across the finish line, if we have something that's, uh, that we can be very proud of, but more importantly, will be very effective of uh, serving all, all American families. So thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you for your testimony. The conversation has been very informative. All of the members who asked questions, I think that uh, all of our notes are pretty substantial. And this is incredibly helpful as we look be towards 2023 in the Farm Bill, as we work to ensure that we can expand access to conservation programs by really bringing uh, the programs that you all run to new communities, making it easier for producers to participate um, in programs that they know and, and that they benefit from. So I, uh, my gratitude to the ranking member, we missed having him in person. Uh, my appreciation for the ranking member for the full subcommittee, or excuse me, for the full committee. Um, and just as, as we close out, uh, Mr. Crosby, I thought that the, uh, the comments that she made about the 81 new enhancements to CSP, I'll be following up because I'd love to get an itemized list of those. I'm really appreciative of some of the comments and answers that you gentlemen brought to this discussion. Um, and certainly, um, as we close out today, again, Mr. Crosby, I want to say that the legacy you discussed from your family's experience losing their farmland in Mississippi to the fact that you are now uh, at the helm of programs that allow farmers across the country uh, to, to make a bit more money and have a bit more stability and income uh, and certainty on their lands is, is quite, a, uh, quite a trajectory. So um, I'm really appreciative that you've brought your perspective and your work here today. Thank you again to both you, Mr. Cosby, and you, Mr. Ducheneau. And with that, under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Conservation and Forestry is adjourned.